All right. Uh, should we go ahead and start the introduction to get going, Magda? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. So it's a pleasure for me to go ahead and introduce um, one of the best students I've ever had in my research group, Janisha Liu. So she got her, um, her BS and master's from Fudan University. And um, I went ahead and, and met her first um, here in the States in around uh, 2002. And she went ahead and uh, joined my research group. And she did a lot of excellent solid state NMR work uh, here at Miami University in Ohio. She graduated here uh, from Miami and then took a postdoc in Rob Tico's lab there at NIH. She worked there for a few years and also, if I remember, at uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs for a short time. And then she took a position where she's currently an assistant professor at Shanghai Tech University. So, Janisha, um, the title of your talk is going to be The Amyloid Structures and Cell Nephrophysis. So, <laughs> welcome. Thank you um, for the introduction. And uh, I'm so glad to see Dr. Lorigan here today. And uh, so, so I took this research pass all because of Dr. Lorigan, where in his lab, I learned this solid state and more. <coughs> um, so I never know it's so interesting. And he has given me all those uh, um, opportunities for me to explore. And also finally, um, for, promote me to go to, um, actually encourage, encourage me to go to NIH for the further study. And uh, actually at Dr. Lorigan's lab also, um, during one of the conference, I also met Ron. Uh, actually he drove me to, Michigan, I remember the, I, we were in his truck. And so today, um, I want to tell you um, our discovery on the amyloid structure in cell necroptosis. So um, I'm from Shanghai Tech University. This university is a, um, a kind of new university. So first, I want to thank. Uh, oh, I also want to thank the organizer for giving me this uh, um, an opportunity to present our work to all the audience. Um, before I tell about our work, I want to give you a brief introduction on the cell net, uh, cell deaths. So there are uh, several um, actively regulated uh, programmed cell deaths. For example, apoptosis is a famous one. Um, it's a mild uh, cell death. Uh, it can happen during embryogenesis in response to stress and in tissue homostasis. But necroptosis is a different one. It involves the cell memory disruption. Therefore, it will cause uh, severe body inflammation. There are also other type of cell deaths like paraptosis, ferroptosis, and here we are not going to talk about. For um, cell necroptosis, as I mentioned, um, so um, the cell membrane will be disrupted, and it is uh, um, by this protein called MLKL. This protein first as a monomer. Then after its phosphorylation, it will um, change its structure and translocate it to the membrane, therefore disrupt the membrane. And all this happens only when this protein called the RIPK3, and this protein forms a homo oligomer. RIPK3 uh, is the receptor interactive protein kinase 3. So it's a kinase, it can phosphorylate itself and phosphorylate MLKL, but only when it forms its homo oligomer. So there are many pathways that can lead to uh, cell necroptosis, but all merged on this point that this homo oligomer formation. And the left pathway is tumor necrosis factor and other factor induced where the RIPK1 and RIPK3 will form this uh, Hetero oligomer, as shown here, then the hetero oligomer probably forms uh, this uh, template 
to recruit more RIPQ3 for its homo oligomer formation. And in the middle pathway is lipid polysaccharide induced pathway, where you can see this protein called the TRIF will interact with RIPQ3 forms hetero oligomer. And on the right side is a virus induced. So upon virus invasion, this uh, DNA, uh, ZDNA binding protein, DNI, will interact with RIPQ3 forms the, the hetero oligomer. And those hetero oligomer are also sometimes called a necrosome. And So before our study, actually the um, hetero oligomer RIPK1 and RIPK3 structure is uh, already published. It is a hetero amyloid structure. And um, this structure is a solid state NMR structure um, provided by Dr. McDermott and the Wuhouse group. Well, you can see here RIPK1 and the K3 um, form this uh, uh, parallel in register bed sheet structure. And there are two layer of this bed sheet structure arranged in an anti-parallel way. Um, one is in this direction, the other in the, uh, this direction. And based on this structure, they also proposed a homo um, oligomer structure for RIPK1 and RIPK3. RIPK1, K3 hetero oligomer cannot directly induce MLKL phosphorylation and the following structure transformation. So only um, the RIPK3 homo oligomer structure can do the job. And uh, that, that's what we study here. Also, we want to understand how the hetero oligomer can induce the homo oligomer formation. And in these slides, I want to also point out this red tab. It says the rim is called the rib homotypic interaction motive. And those proteins all contain rim domain. Actually, the protein oligomeration is initiated through this rim domain. It is through the uh, intermolecular interaction between this room, ring domain. The ring domain is a conservative sequence, but the most conservative segment is in the middle, these four residues. The middle, uh, the first and the third residue are always hydrophobic residues. The second residue is Q, and the last residue is glycine. So as I said, this rib K three as the kinase domain and a rim domain. And this uh, um, oligomerization is uh, actually through the rim domain. So we only cloned the C-terminal part of the protein for both the human RIPK3 and the mouse cube RIPK3. And uh, for human it's 100 residues in the lens and the mouse there are 77 residues. The protein in vitro can form this uh, um, fiber-like structure if you observe them and the TM. And this uh, um, sample ha can give you this X3 powder fraction pattern. You can see there are two rings correspond to 4.7 astro and 9.7 astro. And this is uh, consistent with this amyloid cross beta structure where the bed sheet for each bed strand, the distance between them is about 4.8 astra, and the distance between the layer of the bed uh, sheet is about 10 astra. So with this, we also prepare the uniform carbon-13 nitrogen labeled um, protein and prepare the sample for the uh, solid state and mass study. We obtained um, 2D and uh, 3D spectra. And here shows this 2D carbon carbon um, correlation spectra. And uh, we can see um, the peak are separated very well and the uh, resolution is good. And the, from the 1D slides, you also can see the line width is also quite narrow. And uh, based on all those solid state and more the spectra, we were able to assign those peaks. And we found there are about 20 residues contribute 
to the spectra. So for the solid state NMR, as we know, um, those uh, flexible region and those residues who has very fast dynamic motion, they will not uh, contribute to the solid state NMR um, spectrum. So, so there are only 20 residues that contribute to the fiber core. Uh, <clears throat> and the chemical shift, which means the position of the peaks is very sensitive um, to the environment of the nuclear then can give us the secondary structure information of the protein. So by uh, summarizing this chemical shift, we can predict um, based on chemical shift that there are three bed strands um, for these um, fibers. And it's also consistent with the um, online prediction tools based only on the sequence. So we, all, we can also um, use the tallest prediction and um, get this torsion angle information. So here, I want to switch to show you the amyloid beta fiber structures here. Uh, there are four of them. And actually, I want to tell you this four fibers and they are difference in the number of subunits. Like here, these are two subunits here, then this one has three subunits. This one has two and this one has three. So for solid state NMR, we cannot get the, the number of subunit information. So we have to use the other techniques. And the one um, parameter we used is the mass value. Since we know this two subunit mass will be less than the three subunit fiber. And as a fiber, the length is different for different fiber. So the real meaningful parameter we used is mass per unit length value. Since we know for, for the each subunit layer, the distance will be about 4.8 astro. So this is quite certain for all the fibers. So that was what we used. So we obtained this mass value using dark field TM, where you can see this light fiber structure and then this bright one. The bright one is actually from tobacco mosaic virus. And this virus is showing here, it's a molecular standard for us. And it has this uh, um, protein capsid core, uh, um, capsid shell on its surface. Actually, its molecular mass, mass is mainly determined by this protein um, structure. So it's already known and by comparing this brightness between these two, uh, we did a many uh, counts. And finally summarized in this graph, and you can see um, this mass per length value is about 18 kilodot per nanometer. And this red line here indicates uh, 20 kilodot per nanometer. If this uh, fiber only have one subunit, at this intersection, uh, cross-section view. So our result, although it's very, uh, it's a little bit less than 20 kilodalton, but it's very close. Indicated the fiber uh, only actually have one subunit at the cross-section view. Um, so furthermore, we want to know um, the fiber, whether it adopts a, a parallel bed sheet confirmation or anti-parallel bed sheet confirmation. So in this case, um, we use the carbon-carbon 2D correlation experiment, but use a selective labeled sample, where we use this glycerol, a carbon-13 labeled glycerol as a carbon source and put it in the growth media. This glycerol has its carbon-13 labeled only at the second carbon position, therefore, the protein expressed will have its, uh, um, so most of the residues will only have carbon C alpha labeled, but not C alpha C beta at the same time. And for a uh, uh, 15 millisecond short mixing, it only gives correlations within a residue, a short distance correlation. 
Then in this spectrum, we'll see there's only a few C alpha C beta cross peaks. And those rest revealing as losing serine um, has both C alpha C beta um, carbon labeled, but not other residues. And you can see it, this is for uniform labeled sample. You can see a lot of C alpha C beta cross peaks. But if we increase this mixing time, we see a different spectra. We see a lot more peaks, especially those peaks I highlight for asparagine and glutamine, uh, glutamic acid. Why? And because those residues using two um, carbon 13 glycerol label, uh, labeling, it will have either C alpha labeled or C beta labeled, but not in the same residue. So, um, so they don't see C alpha C beta cross peak here. But when we increase the mixing time, we will see a longer distance um, correlation. So, like this residue here, if this Q is only C beta labeled, but the the neighboring um, peptide, this is C alpha label. So for a longer mixing time, we still can see C alpha, C bed correlation, but it's intermolecular correlation. But this only happens when um, the peptide still adopts this in register parallel bed sheet conformation. If it's anti-parallel, this arrest will be somewhere um, very far, and uh, even 500 milliseconds will not give you this correlation peak. So our result indicates um, from all these residues that the um, uh, it is a, pa a parallel in register bed sheet information. So briefly, we also obtained a more residues context information using solid state NMR. We use the uniform labeled sample and other different selective um, site labeled sample. And for example, here, this is a 2D carbon carbon correlation using 500 millisecond uh, mixing that allow us to see a little bit of further distance where you can see like this and uh, this correlation peak is from glycine 457 to methylene 468 and they are very far in the sequence right but uh, in the space they have close contact so um, in summary the core residue information um, was as ob obtained uh, and through solid state and more. And from the chemical shift, we also know the secondary structure. And the number of subunits was uh, uh, obtained using dark field TM. The tertiary structure is also from um, solid state and more, and also many residual contacts information uh, between different residues. All this information, we put them together, or we calculate, able to calculate the structure. We use uh, this program called Explore NIH. And through a simulated annealing program, we generated these two structure. And for human RIPK3 and mouse RIPK3, where you can see they all have these three bed strands. And the middle bed strand is this most conserved ring uh, sequence for VQIG here and for um, VQVG here. If we align this center sequence, the central bed strand, you can see there's difference between these two structure in that this for mouse RIPK3, the last bed strand is kind of a little bit further from the central uh, strand. For human RIPK3 fiber, we also have a prior EM data that support our result. This result is from Dr. Liu Chong's lab at Shanghai Institute of Organic Chemistry. And this structure was um, obtained using a different protocol. And the length of the sequence is also a, a little bit different from ours. <clears throat> However, if you use a uniform labeled peptide and uh, making this crying EM fiber sample, um, we obtain this solid state animal spectra. It overlay to our spectra very well, and it indicates these two structures indeed the same. 
Although the QIEM uh, data has a little bit lower uh, resolution. So that tells us it's different from A beta and other base folding um, cost fiber, because we know for A beta a little bit uh, difference in the sample preparation will cause um, the fiber have different structure. But here seems not the case for the rib K3 fiber, those functional amyloid. So further, we want to understand what's the structure transformation mechanism. We see this heterooligomer structure and the homooligomer structure. They are quite different. How they can convert to um, from hetero to homooligomer structure. So in other way, we put it in this question that if we generate a hypostatic hetero oligomer structure, rib K1, rib K3, oligomer structure using this homo oligomer structure as a template. So um, will this structure be stable? So we actually um, did it. So we carefully compare the sequence as we know the sequence can uh, are quite conservative, can be aligned very well. But we see this part here for this NCS, this part is um, corresponds to the first loop here. It can be aligned this way and also this way. Both are fine. So we actually did for both. We basically mutated the sequence here and every other one to rip K1. Then we did a 15 millisecond equilibrium and molecular simul dynamic simulation using XPRO NIH. And we found uh, for both of the hypostatic fiber after 15 milliseconds, this first bed strand and the second bed strand, they opened actually. So they exposed those hydrophobic residues in, in between. Then we align this structure to the published heterooligomer structure. We only compare this layer, one layer. We found that they are quite match, matched. So um, we have this explanation now. So for the heterooligomer structure, since this part is open, this hydrophobic residues um, will be open to the solution. It's not stable. So it quite makes sense it will have two layers of this structure to, to bury these hydrophobic residues inside the structure core. Then when it recruits more and more RIPK3 peptide in, then basically the fiber um, property will be dominant by RIPK3. And then uh, for RIPK3, and it's more stable to be this conformation. Therefore, the two layers of this uh, bed sheet will come apart and each will fold tight into this uh, um, homo oligomer structure. So that is our hypothesis based on our, on our simulation. And on the simulation, we also find for homo oligomer, um, it stays in this conformation, but it developed a slight twist, a left-handed twist. And as we know, um, for fiber structure, it's always uh, um, stable to have this kind of twist. And for different from solid state and more, other technique like cryo-EM and other image technique can tell us the fiber has this uh, slight uh, twist. But the solid state NMR cannot tell us this information. Then with the help of Dr. Liu Chong, and we obtain this FM image, where along this fiber axis, you can see the height changes um, periodically, and it's quite uh, um, consistent. And from this height, we're able to calculate the fiber distance. So this uh, height difference is caused by the fiber twist. And um, so and then finally the result is about six degree for, for this twist of, um, between neighboring peptide. It's quite consistent uh, with our MD relaxation simulation. 
And then furthermore, we understand, we all understand that central, this central bed strand is very important to its function. But actually nobody um, realized there are the first and the third bed strand here. So our collaborator, Dr. Wang Huayi from our school helped us design this a mutation experiment and studied the peptide, uh, the protein function on the cell level, cellular level. And first, they did this uh, single side mutation. They chose this middle residue for each bed strain and uh, mutated them to aspartic acid. And also for um, allylin, more conservative um, mutation. Then they also did this segment replacement, replace the first best strand, second or last best strand to allylin. It's showing here, here, and uh, here. Then at this NIH3T3 cell, and they use this TSZ3 drug combination, they can induce the cell to go through necroptosis if the cell expresses this uh, mouse 3 protein. And indeed, for wide type, uh, most of cell died, and this was detected by the ATP level. But the mutation seems totally inhibit cell necroptosis. Um, for this type of mutation, for there, and you can see it only affects, but not so significant. So furthermore, this study the, the uh, protein um, protein interaction at the cellular level. They studied the interaction between uh, mouse ribk one and uh, mouse ribk three by putting a tag a flag tag on the ribk three. And this experiment is done at using this uh, two ninety three T cell. And in the cell lysis, you can see. Um, both the protein expressed well, except the vector. In the vector, there's only RIPK1 expressed, and we purposely didn't put the gene for RIPK3. And uh, then, if you use this uh, flag, uh, so for RIPK3, there's a flag tag. So if you use this flag beads to pull down RIPK3, you will see the, uh, the beads will pull down all the RIPK3 for all this. And cells. And then since RIPK1 and RIPK3 has molecular interaction, and RIPK1 will be pulled down at the same time. So we'll see it. It is for wide type and for this three single side mutation, but not for the segment replacement. So that tells us the segment replacement totally changes the protein structure. So it uh, inhibits this. Uh, um, intermolecular interaction, but the single site mutation hasn't changed the intermolecular interaction. So although the cell necroptosis are inhibited for all of this, but the mechanism is different. So for the segment mutation, the interaction between the K1 and the K3 was um, abolished. Um, but the for three single site mutation, it's not the case. So we further studied these three single site mutation. We found that they are still fibers. They can still form fiber. And however, if you, um, we use the THT for reasons um, to detect the fiber formation in kinetics. So THT is this fluorescence dye that can bind to the fiber. And its intensity will reflect um, the fiber formation. We can see for these two um, different proteins, this formation and the increased curve is different. And furthermore, we um, choose two um, mutation. We also did a solid state NMO study, where this is this green color for the Q mutation and the blue color is for the L mutation. So this mutation, F mutation, we didn't have um, enough sample to carry out the solid state NMA study. Um, we can see the spectra changed a lot. There are peak missing um, for the mu mutant fiber and uh, also peak positioning changes. Well, for example, here, this is the isoleucine peak for wide type 
and this isoleucine is here for 50. And for these two mutations, the green and the blue color, you can see it's moved here. It is a significant change. So, so far you can see, um, and so far that's all our results for P3 fiber. And after that, we also carried out the RIPK1 fiber structure study. These are unpublished data, where we surprisingly see this kind of um, lattice pattern for mouse rib K1. We know Ross mouse rib K1 and the K3 has very um, conservative sequence, right? And so it's a surprise for us. Then later we found actually, if you change the sample condition, the buffer condition, we actually can fine tune this fiber into this single stranded structure or this web like structure. And both structure give a similar uh, solid state NMR spectra that tell us uh, at least at the second secondary structure level, they are still the same. However, um, probably at further uh, tertiary or, or quartertiary radio contact level, there are difference. So we are still working on to solve this structure. And first, uh, we actually um, gained the help from Dr. Wang Chuan's lab to try to see if they can give us a good uh, cry em tomograph um, result. And this is the uh, um, okay. Uh, yeah. What? Uh, here. Uh, uh, this is the image, the tomograph image, where you cannot see much um, because the resolution is uh, kind of low, and, but it uh, give us a little bit of information that tell us this lattice structure actually is um, from this single fiber overlay and uh, um, one layer after the other and form this kind of um, hexagon pattern if you look on the top of it. So basically they are formed by this single um, single threaded fiber. They can arrange it in a certain way and aligned in a certain way. So it's very interesting. And uh, so we have, um, uh, basically it tells us this, um, unfortunately, this crying M still cannot help us in this, structure we have um, still focused on using solid state and um, so Finally, I want to conclude here. As you can see, there are more questions to be answered. For example, do these proteins adopt similar amyloid structures? And the other question is, what is the interaction mechanism between different proteins? And there are proteins that can pro promote the RIPK3 homo oligomer formation, like RIPK1, K3, um, hetero oligomer um, formation, and that will promote the RIPK3 homo oligomer formation. But there are cases that um, the protein intermolecular interaction competes, even prevent RIPK3 homo oligomer formation. For example, some virus, if it invades the cell, the virus itself contains a protein which has this RIM domain. It will interact with RIPK1 or K3 in the cells and form this hetero oligomer, uh, prevent the RIPK3 from homo oligomer, therefore prevent the cell necroptosis. It's a kind of way for the virus to um, survive. Okay, and so finally, I want to um, thank my students. Um, and Dr. Wu Xialian, she's my first PhD student um, for the RIPK3 work. And uh, Liu Jing, um, she did uh, most of the RIPK1 work. And uh, also Hu Hong from Dr. Wang Hua Yi's lab for the cell level studies. I also want to thank Charles from NIH for the calculation help and Dr. Liu Tsung and Dr. Wang Quan. And also I want to thank um, Dr. Wang Jian, our NMR facility manager for the 
uh, help. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Okay. Wonderful. We have time for some questions. Is that a picture of you guys at the Shanghai Disney? Yes, uh, uh, two years ago. Okay, wow. Uh -huh. Questions from the audience? You can go ahead and just speak up or type them in if you please. I, I had a question when you're looking at your solid state of Mars. What happens if when you're doing the solid state of Mars structural studies, it, it's kind of easy like with doing some of the imaging stuff, but what uh -huh. happens if you have some um, heterogeneity in your sample? Yes. Like between the homo and versus the hetero, it, it, d does that cause distortions or did you run across that sometimes in your samples when you were making them? Mm -hmm. Um, so for this uh, study, it's very important to prepare a homogeneous sample. So we always try and um, we have to test uh, different conditions to find the best quality spectra. So from the spectral quality, we will uh, be able to tell if the sample is homogeneous or not. So if the condition is not controlled well, then the spectral resolution will be lower and then you will see the peak not uh, um, for each residue there's not single peak but actually multiple peak or very broad peak and sometimes it will be a problem for us to do the assignment and later and right, looks yeah so it's uh, i'm sorry <laughs> no go ahead so i'm sorry okay um from the tm you sometimes can see different um, images, but not, it's, it can help us to judge if the sample is homogeneous or not. But it's not enough. Sometimes, like this two sample, it gives similar solid state animal spectra. But sometimes um, you can see very different image will give you different spectra that can give you a clue. Okay, and then uh, Cheng Ming has a question for you. His hands raised. Okay. Um, so do I, um, I, don't, I, don't I can know. go ahead and read it. He, um, yeah. he wants to know, hi, um, in your RIPK1 spectra, do you see peak doubling because of mixed morphologies? Um, I, I don't see much. Sometimes I see uh, like this, uh, uh, this is residue T521. Only at this side chain level, I see peak uh, doubling, but not at the um, backbone like C alpha C beta. So it's only at the C gamma and some position, a little bit, but not so significant. So that's it. Um, like the isoleucines? Um, the isoleucine does not uh, have, okay, um, a peak doublet. But uh, for different uh, um, structure, there is a slight uh, chemical shift to position change, a very small change um, for the different cases. So there's no doublet. Uh. All right, and then we have a question from Christian. He wants to know, uh, you had some mutants on the way which form fibrils as well. Where do these mutants come from? And then are they naturally occur occurring or do they introduce them to the probe details of the amyloid structure? Um, I have some mutants. Uh, uh, yeah, these mutants is not natural occurring. Um, so we, we just designed it. So we first uh, just try to get it as different as possible from the original residue. That's why we made it as partic acid and introduce a charge. Uh, the purpose is to disrupt the structure. We want to see the effect. Um, so that's, uh, that's the purpose. So we want to prove this three bed strand have some um, really uh, an an implication in its uh, uh, regulating its function. And um, because previously, as the hetero oligomer suggests, uh, the main focus of the structural core is at the center, not here and there and at the end. 
All right. Well, let's go ahead and thank Janisha for the outstanding talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So I will um, come out. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the second speaker for our seminar series, Dr. Govin who is a full professor at a new chemistry unit and chair of the education technology unit at Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research uh, in uh, Bangalore, India. He received his uh, master's degree from Bangalore University and PhD from the National Chemical Laboratory, uh, Pune, India. Then he did uh, his postdoctoral research uh, in the States at the University of Wisconsin uh, Medicine. And um, he, and after that in Max Planck Institute of uh, Molecular Physiology in uh, Germany. Dr. Govin is the recipient of a multiple awards and honors among which uh, the Humboldt uh, Fellowship uh, Germany Innovative Young uh, Biotechnologist Award of DBT India, Sir Raman Young Scientist Award, uh, Award uh, IPS, uh, and then Young Scientist Award, Award uh, CDR, um, Award at 219 for Excellence in Drug Research, National Prize uh, for Research, in peptides and nucleic acids. Uh, Dr. Govan is also the founding a member of Indian National Young Academy of Sciences. Uh, his uh, research interests are at the interface of chemistry, biology, and uh, biomaterials uh, science, which includes Alzheimer's disease, uh, peptide chemistry, uh, molecular probes, uh, diagnostic uh, therapies, and um, uh, molecular uh, uh, tectonics. Um, and he has uh, published more than uh, 150 publications. He has more than 35 patents and uh, four books. It's extremely uh, prolific and uh, productive, and uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, your slides are not on. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, uh, can you see my slide? Yeah, you're perfect. We can okay, hear wonderful. you perfectly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction, uh, Dr. Uh, Magda. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, let me also thank uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Rams uh, for the invitation and also uh, congratulations to Professor Ram and colleagues, all of you for this running this wonderful platform on a very regular uh, basis. I also would like to thank the very nice, wonderful talk uh, from the previous speaker. Uh, uh, although I would like to uh, you know, add a disclaimer, uh, I'm not a a structural chemist. I'm an organic chemist, and uh, also a you know medicinal and chemical biologist. So with that, let me start with my talk today. I'm going to talk to you on Alzheimer disease with a little bit of uh, historical perspective uh, in terms of its disease mechanisms, whatever we know, and also current status uh, in terms of uh, pathophysiology, diagnostic therapeutic and uh, therapeutic uh, modalities, of course, from the literature, what we know, and also from our own uh, research uh, uh, efforts. Uh, if possible, I will also give some uh, uh, future, you uh, know, overview, uh, probably, you know, some overview for the future uh, developments. Uh, let me take a 30 second and then, you know, kind of, uh, you know, tell us, tell you what we do in our research laboratory in Bangalore, uh, India. We are interested in proteins, just like many of you. So we are interested in this uh, protein-based materials. And uh, when, when these protein-based materials are useful, we call them uh, functional amyloids. For example, silk is one of the best example. We are, we are uh, trying to use silk and its mimetic 
tasks for biomaterial application, including uh, neuro uh, generation, which is which uh, it is complementary to what I'm going to talk to you today, although I will not touch upon the aspect of neurogeneration itself. Right? In the process, we also you know, kind of establish a new concept that we call it as molecular architectonics, which is simply a reductionistic approach of designing materials, you know, like you know, silk and silk mimetics, and use you know, for various biomaterial application, as I already mentioned, which is not in the scope of uh, today's talk. Of course, these protein-based materials are, uh, can be toxic, so I don't have to emphasize too much uh, on you know on that uh, you know on on this particular uh, aspects uh, to this uh, August uh, audience, but nevertheless, so when they become toxic, we call them disease amyloids, and we are interested in one you know disease amyloid and responsible for many many very many diseases, and we are particularly interested in. Uh, uh, you know, Alzheimer's disease in terms of understanding disease mechanisms and also developing diagnostic and therapeutic uh, modalities. Uh, possibly, you know, I'll skip this uh, because it's too preliminary for the, you know, for the talk today. I'll also skip this. Coming to Alzheimer's disease, just to, for the sake of, you know, continuity, as we all aware, the disease was first identified by Alois Alzheimer treating the patient Augusta Dieter in 1906. And uh, the, the autopsy of the AD patient brain uh, reveals two kinds of protein aggregates. One is uh, uh, flux, other one is tangles. And of course, we also, you know, flux related to A beta and tau, related, uh, sorry, tangles related to tau. What is important is, of course, we know AD constitutes 60 to 80% of all dementia cases. Although the disease has been identified more than 100 years ago, still there are no fully approved uh, diagnosis or cure for this uh, chronic uh, disease. What is more alarming is that while all the major diseases are showing decline in terms of the you know, number of cases or death, when I say decline, it's not that the cases are actually declining, but there is uh, availability of you know, detection and treatment you know, because of the biomedic advancements in biomedical research in those area. But in case of Alzheimer's disease, if you see that here, so there is a rise of you know, you know, 71%. Of course, uh, here I would like to add that this is a very old data from 2013. As I speak, this is already crossed 100%. And even more alarming is that, uh, you know, I'm speaking, you know, I'm from uh, India, uh, Asia. Uh, when I, I started uh, my research career almost 14, you know, close to 14 years ago. And when I started, in fact, uh, many, uh, you know, of my scientific colleagues, not even public, they used to ask me, why are you interested in this, this particular disease? Because, you know, this, it was conceived uh, in this part of the world that Alzheimer's and the other uh, neurodegenerative diseases, if not all, at least some of them, are disease of, you know, Western countries or developed countries. But of course, you know, I particularly use this slide to emphasize in India. Now, after 14 years, let me tell you that no, that question is no longer asked. Now, public is very well aware, not just scientific community. And the number of Alzheimer's disease cases are also going uh, up. I know, in fact, there is a steep rise in Asia, uh, particularly India. But because some of you may be aware that our population is huge, even, you know, very fraction of a, that population can, can be very, uh, very, very huge. But nevertheless, this is awareness about Alzheimer's disease is uh, reasonably, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, increased uh, over the you know, over the years. In fact, people are now asking about whether we are doing something for this particular uh, disease, as this is going to, you know, impact public health and economy. You all possibly aware, all, you know, well aware that, you know, Alzheimer's disease may become number one disease uh, very soon. Uh, in terms of molecular mechanism, uh, there is a uh, human amyloid precursor protein, a transmembrane protein, which can be processed by you know group of uh, you know, proteases. We call them secretases, alpha, beta, and gamma. Particularly, the cleavage involving beta and gamma secretase leads to generation of, of these beta amyloids, A beta peptides. We generally call them A beta peptides, which is sticky, meaning undergo uh, aggregation through beta sheet formation. Of course, also supported by other non-covalent interactions to form polymorphic aggregation species such as oligomers, photofibrils, and also fully grown uh, fibrils that correspond, you know, sub correspondings to uh, flux, uh, you know, which I, you know, discussed, uh, you know, mentioned in the earlier slide. And uh, this entire, this process can be, you know, further aggravated 
by the presence of free you know biometals such as copper and uh, iron which are redox metals and also our previous speaker uh, alluded to peroptosis you know at one point and uh, this is you know in fact although i am not going to mention but very much you know part of this uh, you know the 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 disease mechanism so here the inclusion of these metals you know in fact this presence of these free redox metals acceler accelerate this you know aggregation process and also uh, become a factory you know is a machine for generating reactive oxygen species so these reactive oxygen ab beta aggregation species embedded with reactive oxygen you know uh, uh, metals leading to you know generation of you know ras that leads to oxidative stress and inflammation to you know we call them you know all all of it we call together a beta burden burden that leads to collapse of another protein which is not very well understood uh, so nevertheless the collapse of tau you know from a it is a microtubule binding protein so collapse of uh, tau and its under aggregation leads to formation of neurofibrillary tangles or simply we call them tangles so together that leads to you know multiple toxicities that's why alzheimer is a no longer a, a, a linear or a simple disease rather a complex disease and that's why you know we also you know term it as a multifactorial uh, disease so here i would like to mention of course the first point uh, is you know i don't have to emphasize to this audience so a true disease is not an inevitable part of aging and uh, recently national institute on aging and alzheimer's association came up with a research framework that is in 2018 and this uh, research framework designated ya beta tau and related neurodegeneration as a you know as a reliable biomarkers so now you all of are um, uh, aware that the alzheimer detection is mostly is through behavioral you know symptoms uh, you know which are visual meaning that is already advanced stage of alzheimer disease and this framework you know argue that just a cognitive decline you know cannot be cons or a behavioral symptoms cannot be considered uh, as a you know as, you know is a you know a true diagnosis for alzheimer disease rather one has to use uh, these uh, biomarkers and uh, in addition to that this research framework also left this list uh, open ended meaning you know as and when if somebody uh, identify and validates a new biomarker so that can be added to this list so i am mentioning because the to tell you the importance of a beta tau and neurodegeneration in uh, uh, alzheimer disease but also would like to you know mention this open ended you know the framework is open uh, the list is open ended meaning you know you can also you know add you know if there is any reliable uh, biomarkers so now once again emphasize you know particularly you know if you know it is again you know you are you know you are all well aware but i would like to make a point here that why there are no fully approved diagnoses or a drugs for alzheimer disease as we are aware either you know research in academia or in pharma mostly you know kind of uh, efforts in the, in academia or uh, pharma companies mostly targeted at individual uh, toxicity routes in alzheimer disease it can for example uh, it in you know, the alzheimer disease uh, involve you know is a multi you know faceted tox involve multifaceted toxicity that uh, comprises of uh, polymorphic species of a beta and tau and there is a malfunctioning uh, of uh, clearance of these uh, toxic uh, aggregation species and these aggregation species also cause membrane uh, toxicity uh, mitochondrial uh, dysfunction and the ras plays a very very important role here uh, which not only is leading to oxidative stress and inflammation but they also can leads to you know biomolecular damage and there are many other uh, disease pathways which are possibly you know at early stage including inhibition of telomerase activity and so on and so forth so meaning targeting individual you know routes particularly you know either a beta or you know some you know other uh, routes is you know is, is not going to help us uh, in any way you know when we are dealing with alzheimer disease in that context we are uh, adopting multi pronged strategies for uh, developing diagnostic and therapeutic tools and possibly i'll you know in the in the, in the next uh, you know so, you know 10 15 minutes i will going to you know kind of uh, you know tell you what we are doing so this is a, a comprehensive book on alzheimer disease uh which uh, talks about uh, you know current status of you know pathophysiology diagnostic and therapeutic modalities uh, uh which for, you know if you are interested possibly can uh, refer to for more details 
So now coming to amyloid toxicity. So you mentioned about uh, A beta and amyloid uh, toxicity. So how you know we can visualize this amyloid toxicity? Of course, that can be measured by cell viability. If you take a uh, neuronal cells, see these are the healthy neuronal cells. This is an AFM uh, data, and you know if you measure their cell viability, you will see more or less you know under percent. However, when these cells, healthy cells, come in contact uh, with A-beta or, you know, in the test tube experiment, if you treat these cells with uh, uh, A-beta and you would see that they interact with uh, these healthy cells and then, you know, particularly the membranes of these healthy cells, that leads to the formation of uh, extensive network, uh, network of uh, stress fibers. Of course, the stress fibers are, you know, formation is not uncommon, but in case uh, of amyloid toxicity, so there is a formation of, you know, uh, 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 extensive uh, formation of these fibers, stress fibers, and that will lead to neurodegeneration or a cellular death that disrupt neuronal uh, circuit or a network, even sometimes we can, we call it uh, in, our lean, in layman terms, wiring. So meaning we have hundreds of, you know, under billions of uh, neurons, which are connected uh, through trillions of connections and when these uh, cells die so the, the 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 network or a circuit is disrupted that leads to a uh, problem in learning memory and in general cognitive decline what we all have to do so here also i would like to mention not only the stress fiber formation that there is also a adverse cellular mechanics i'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a while so what we have to do is we need to identify this state and possibly devise uh, some molecular tools to rescue them and bring, you know, put them back to their healthy state. So the RAS reactive oxygen species, I talked about reactive oxygen species, these tiny species, uh, believe me, they are such a, you know, so useful, you know, important in, in, the, in the physiology. So, you know, that's why I say that, you know, life saving, but if they cross, the threshold concentration, they can, they became, you know, they can have a life threatening uh, effect. So here we have oxygen. So which is, which oxygen goes to water uh, through a four, you know, reduction, you know, under reduction to water uh, through a four electron system. In the process, it generates three uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. You have superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and uh, hydroxyl radicals. And of course, among the three, hydrogen peroxide is slightly as a long uh, lifetime. And this hydrogen peroxide, and uh, you know, is catalyzed by myelin peroxidase uh, to produce hypo, you know, hypochlor, you know, hypochlorous acid. Again, this has a life-saving uh, effect, and this is actually produced in phagosome and neutrophils. And uh, if you vaguely remember, uh, particularly very, very relevant in uh, Corona pandemic uh, time, if you vaguely rem remember, there was a, a bleach controversy so in US. Uh, and you know, I will not go into the details where you know it was suggested that you know you know bleach uh, you know can be a possibly uh, an option uh, for a treatment. But well, there was it was not uh, incomplete, uh, full you know you know you know it was not fully incomplete because bleach is actually a salt of hypochlorous acid. However, if hypochlorous acid is produced within our body, endogenous production uh, you know can actually kill the pathogens, you know, it's a digest the pathogens. However, we cannot take uh, this bleach or H4CL uh, you know, externally, that will be very, very dangerous. Anyway, so leaving that uh, aside, uh, uh, under Alzheimer condition, there is a overexpression of myeloperoxidase that leads to uh, production of excessive hypochlorous acid, you know, acid that will have life-threatening effect. All of which, you know, it's a loop. Uh, there is a loop among all these uh, reactive oxygen species that leads to oxidative stress, inflammation, and biomolecular damage, and uh, all this aggravates the condition of uh, Alzheimer, uh, you know, uh, uh, disease. So uh, we, at some point, we develop a very a small near infrared uh, molecular probe, uh, which is. Uh, uh, very selectively label uh, amyloid beta flux uh, in the AD brain. So this the, the data you see here is the the, the AD brain uh, samples, of course, uh, postpartum uh, uh, samples. And uh, here we are, uh, you know, staining the you know the tissues uh, with our probe as well as an antibody for tau uh, aggregates here. And you can see this overlay. And uh, this is very very our probe is very selective for a beta, and uh, 
we uh, so we all know about antibodies how selective and sen, you know uh, sensitive they are uh, you know sen, you know but here rarely we come across small molecules uh, which will have you know such a you know high sensitivity and selectivity the, the probe which I, which i am talking about here is a you know very unique you know one such unique probe which has antibody selectivity and sensitivity for a beta flux it will not bind to tau now you might be asking this question why uh, you know a beta is important uh, over tau because a beta is very specific to alzheimer disease but not tau tau itself is responsible for many neurodegenerative diseases including tauopathies and so on and so forth so here we have a probe a developed it you know molecular tool and also a method to not only detect alzheimer disease but also differentiate alzheimer disease from uh, other neurodegenerative de diseases including tauopathies of course i'm not giving all the data which is published so you may also you know take a look but what i'm emphasizing here is we are you know, have a molecular tool very unique you know tool which detect alzheimer disease also differentiate alzheimer disease from other neurodegenerative diseases this is particularly useful uh, in not only in uh, ad related dementia cases but also ad linked mixed dementia cases where alzheimer can coexist with many other neurodegenerative diseases uh, of course so this is the data which i show you showing here is ex vivo sample and uh, so for a real uh, stick applications we need to study uh, this you know uh, evaluate this probe in the uh, uh, in vivo uh, studies uh, so for that we have a double transgenic mice model uh, in our lab app ps1 model and of course this is the data from the ad patients and here is the you know you can see that our probe this is the wild type mice and this is the ad phenotypic mice and uh, you see that you know how clean our data uh, is uh, from the cq and this cq was you know actually administered to the mice and this also crosses the brain barrier of course due to paucity of time i'll not go into the detail except to say that so it is a very very unique uh, probe uh, you know that can be possibly used for uh, near infrared based uh, uh, imaging application uh, of course we also developed several uh, molecular tools such molecular tools which uh, i will not be uh, talking about all i would like to say here that uh, using some of our molecular tools we could actually image this multifaceted toxicity the image you see is actually you know can tell you how complex alzheimer disease uh, is and also here in we identified and validated a beta flux along with a ros specific ros which can be possibly you know used as a combination by you know by a marker and also you know possibly can be added to the national institute on aging and alzheimer association that research framework at least of course we are moving ahead we also propose Uh, uh, at this stage, we propose that you know one can use multi, you know, flexing and multimodal uh, probing, probing of uh, multiple biomarkers, such so that one can generate one can generate such a fingerprint, and this fingerprint can be used for differentiating Alzheimer disease, you know, patients from uh, you know healthy patients or other uh, you know patients. In fact, some of these uh, our invention from our lab now we are taking you know translating in our startup company. to develop a reliable platform for alzheimer disease uh, uh, detection uh, uh, you know apart from other you know uh, providing imaging and diagnostic solutions so that's a uh, brief uh, about uh, you know kind of a little bit of historical uh, you know in terms of the pathophysiology of alzheimer disease and our own effort in terms of uh, you know developing diagnostic platform now coming to treatment you all uh, aware so these are the some of the drugs available in the market uh, for alzheimer disease treatment although you know as you are also aware that you know they do not uh, these are uh, you know acetylcholine uh, inhibitors or nmda receptor antagonists basically they modulate the enz uh, the, the, the some of the the chemicals neuro you know neurotransmitters levels in the brain so meaning they only give temporary relief they do not target underlying mechanisms of uh, alzheimer disease so meaning there are no fully approved drugs for uh, you know the target for pathology so nevertheless again this is a was a big news for the community uh, so the one of the immuno you know therapy was approved uh, last year uh, precisely june uh, in june and uh, that is adulam by biogen and again this is a conditional approval and it's not a you know uh, you know it's not a, a full or a complete uh, approval 
So here I would fairly, it's fair enough to say that there are no fully approved drugs that target core pathology. Uh, and also there are absolutely no treatments uh, for advanced stage of, uh, stages of Alzheimer's disease. So in this process, we wanted to understand uh, Alzheimer's disease pathology, uh, pathophysiology, particularly you know, with respect to A-beta, that is A-beta, and we all uh, we know that this A-beta 14 to 23 sequence, that is a you know, core recognition sequence, that is the one which drives uh, A-beta aggregation with also, you know, with, uh, you know, you know, a lot of contributions, you know, hydrophobic contributions from this phenylalanine, phenylalanine. So several groups, uh, you know, uh, uh, since the time uh, we come to know, you know, we understood this uh, importance. So several groups, you know, across the world, they try to uh, use this A beta 14 to 23 or its fragments uh, as, a, you know, as a inhibitors. However, there were you know drawbacks uh, because it's a proteolytic stability of these protein you know, peptides, and also the affinity was not good enough to be used as a uh, you know through inhibitor. So, and there are many other efforts to convert that into a peptide mimetic. But here we would wanted to in, you know insert this uh, cyclic peptide is another uh, area of interest uh, in our lab. Uh, again, I can give a separate talk on that. But nevertheless, we uh, designed a amino acid based on this cyclic peptide. Uh, particularly, we got interested in this unit, inserting this unit because uh, there are multiple hydrogen bonding uh, uh, donor acceptor sites here, and also this a rigid system. So you can clearly see here. So we inserted this uh, particular unnatural amino acid at the end terminal, middle, and also C terminal, and in one case we have incorporated in at all the you know three positions. So it's there is an extensive study, beautiful study. So if you are interested, please do refer to this uh, our recent paper. So all I would like to say that is that our studies uh, revealed revealed that the insertion at incorporation of this unnatural amino acid at the center are at the C terminal. Basically, just very close to this phenylalanine, phenylalanine uh, uh, could bind to this A-beta monomer and prevent its aggregation. But the one at the end terminal has no impact because it's very far from this you know, core, you know, core unit. And in fact, this uh, found to be aggregation enhancer, while the other two were found to be aggregation uh, inhibitor. And when you have all the three units was, you know, the unit, you know, the peptidomimetic with all three units was found to be the best uh, uh, aggregation uh, inhibitor. Uh, I think this, you can see that, you know, the one, uh, three, uh, and four, these are all the inhibitors. And, but the one uh, at the end terminal was found to be a, an answer. Of course, we went ahead and then studied uh, immunocytochemistry, uh, uh, performed immunocytochemistry assay. That is the A-beta aggregates. Also, you can see some uh, monomers. And these aggregates, you know, when you in, in, when we uh, uh, interact with the cells, interact with the cell membrane, and that subsequently leads to uh, uh, leads to their cellular uh, death. So, but, however, so this inhibitor, you know, you can see that this particular inhibitor in presence of the inhibitor, so the, it prevents the aggregation, and also you can see that you know uh, so not much of such uh, interaction, you know, uh, with the cell membrane, and because of the presence of histidine and few other amino acids. This also found to you know sequestrate these uh, uh, metals like copper and iron, and also found to exhibit oxidative stress. So this is for now. It's not so important. I will not touch upon this. What I would like to uh, kind of draw your attention is we wanted to understand their you know adverse mechanical effect. See this amyloidogenic stress induced uh, mechanical effect on the uh, on the neuronal cells. So here we used a very uh, unique. Uh, Technique, the so force peak uh, quantitative nanomechanics uh, AFM uh, uh, technique. So that can be used. Uh, so here, using this technique, we not only image the cells, but one can also measure the eye as well as DMT uh, modulus, which is, you know, or simply you can say modulus, which is a measure measure of stiffness. So the one on the you know left hand side, you can see that that is a control cell, a neuronal cell. You can see the smooth surface. And you know absolutely no problem with that. And when we incub incubate this cell with a beta, and you can see that that interacts, you know, undergo aggregation and interacts with the membrane, and leading to the formation of stress fibers, and uh, that leads to 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 making the cell rigid and also tough and flatten the cell. 
and uh, because of that you can see that is a healthy cells exhibits around 6 micron uh, in size the moment uh, it comes in contact with a beta and its aggregation species the you know the stiff, you know the the the, the, the thickness uh, decreased decrease because the cell become you know flattened however in presence of the inhibitor the, the best uh, peptidomimetic inhibitor that uh, prevent the aggregation and protect the cell and you can see that the stiffness so which is you know the stiffness is around 30 kilo uh, so uh, uh, yeah so stiffness also you know re, you know uh, reverse to to uh, uh, lt state lt state you can see that stiffness is around 30 kilo pascal in case of lt cell and that increased to 400, around 400 kilopascal, you know, when they were interacting with the A beta 42. So, but uh, in presence of the peptidomimetic inhibitor, the stiffness is now, you know, kind of reversed in a way that our peptide is, you know, kind of uh, helping, you know, not only helped us understanding this entire A beta aggregation, you know, A beta toxicity, but also and uh, cellular mechanics induced adverse effects, but also help in, you know, reversing or rescuing the cells from such toxicity. And th so this is some of the molecular docking studies, possibly I'll skip it. At this time, at around this time, you are also looking at uh, molecules, you know, which can, uh, you know, have a multifunctional effect, meaning, you know, a beta aggregation is very important, but not everything. So because there is also a oxidative stress, inflammation, and so on and so forth. So in this process, we come across this tripeptide GHK, which is there in our body. In fact, I call it as a you know, natural product from uh, humans, and it does so many functions for us, so many, you know, functions in our body. Uh, so uh, I will not go into the detail, possibly you can, you know, check, check, you know, you know, you can possibly Google and find out how important this one uh, is. So in fact, in adults, uh, you know, the, the body fluid will have around 200 nanogram per ml, but that go as we age, it, you know, it drops down to 18, you know, below 18 nanogram, you know, per ml. And one more important parameter is the KD value. So the KD value of uh, you know metal binding, this copper binding to this GHK is such that it will not affect the metal, you know, enzyme, the, the copper, you know, bound to enzymes. Uh, enzymes rather it can easily sequestrate the copper uh, from the A beta bound, A beta or A, A beta aggregate bound uh, complexes. That is something very very interesting. And based on that, we prepared this multifunctional, you know, in, in, uh, the peptidomimetic conjugate that is GHK, and this is the pept you know hybrid peptide from our previous study. And this, uh, in fact, turns out to be a multifunctional inhibitor, meaning it does, you know, it inhibits A beta aggregation. Uh, you know, and ameliorates uh, ROS antioxidant, you know, serves as antioxidant and anti inflammatory role, and so on and so forth. That was very encouraging. However, there were two issues. One is this serves as a multifunctional inhibitor at a concentration more than 100 micromolar. And secondly, uh, it serves as multifunctional inhibitor in presence of copper. So it's very, very selective to copper. But if you remember, the ROS is also produced in presence of iron. It also produced uh, independent of uh, you know any of these metals. So to make it true multifunctional inhibitor, we did some uh, you know uh, you know chemical modification. I mean I just jokingly say you know kind of a surgery uh, because we are organic chemists and came up with these four multifunctional molecules. Again, you know there is a beautiful data. These molecules now can also bind sequestrate iron and uh, you know serves as a very good antioxidant and anti-inflammatory uh, molecules all of which is reported here and uh, all i would like to say that while all of them you know function as a multifunctional molecule but particularly the core was found to be the best uh, multifunctional uh, you know modulator of amyloid toxicity and we went ahead and uh, wanted to test you know the true uh, antioxidant or anti-inflammatory effect of our molecule so i'm skipping all the biophysical data so here we wanted to test the effect of our molecule in NRF2 pathway. So NRF2 is a transcriptional uh, factor and which is mostly found in the cytoplasm. And, and uh, whenever we subject the cells uh, to oxidative stress, it translocates to the nucleus, bind to antioxidative uh, uh, response uh, element, upstream of uh, antioxidative response element, and triggers the expression of, you know, uh, you know scores of, uh, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory genes. That's how the cell survives. So you wanted to see how, you know, our molecule will, you know, uh, play a role uh, in this process. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so we can see that. So that is uh, 
tree low. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, you, you're fine. You have uh, about 10 more minutes or so. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So I saw the hand. So, okay, thank oh, you. Oh, it was by mistake. Sorry. Oh, oh okay, okay. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so what you see here are uh, the control uh, uh, cells. And the green stain, what you see, uh, is the, the, the NRF2, which is found in both cytoplasm and the nucleus. And the blue stain, of course, is a nuclear stain, uh, DAPI, uh, DAPI stain. And uh, when you subject these cells to ROS, uh, basically oxidative stress, and you see that the NRF2 is completely translocated uh, to the nucleus. And if you do the same thing, if, you, if we uh, treat the control cells with ROS, uh, re reactive oxygen species, uh, in presence of our compound, you could see that the NRF2 is, you know, kind of still stays in the nucleus, uh, sorry, cytoplasm, very similar to, you know, control cells. Meaning our molecule is actually playing the role which NRF2 was, you know, you know, was, you know, doing, you know, in a way in a 3M biochemical, you know, pathways. So in, in that sense, so NRF, so our molecule, you know, modulate NRF2 pathway under accelerated stress condition by eliminating the toxic uh, stress uh, elements. Of course, this is uh, to summary, many things I have not, uh, you know, discussed uh, here due to paucity of time. So nevertheless, I would like to, uh, you know, mention that you will trust me that, you know, trust me that, you know, compound four GHK analog, you know, which can be a, a peptidomimetic or even we call it as a, you know, small molecule, indeed, you know, a multifunctional molecule and modulate multifaceted amyloid uh, toxicity. Uh, and in this process, we also, you know, come up with a, a new concept that is called hybrid multifunctional uh, inhibitor. Meaning, uh, here integrating the structure and functional elements from two different, you know, kind of a chemical, uh, you know, uh, entities. For example, here we see this is a cleoquinol. I am sure, you know, some of you or all of you must have heard of cleoquinol and its analog. These are the cleoquinol was one of the earliest, uh, you know, molecule which entered, you know, phase uh, uh, one clinical trial for Alzheimer's disease. And its analog, you know, in 2014 uh, entered a phase two uh, trial, but it was uh, taken off uh, from the clinical trials for various reasons, including possibly, you know, toxicity. And in other words, we have this EGCG. So this is from a, a polyphenolic compound from uh, tea. And we all, you know, we recommend, you know, everybody recommend that, you know, drinking green tea is very good for health. But nevertheless, indeed, it's good for health. However, when it comes to its activity, I think I believe there are many groups are studying, including Ram and uh, Professor Rams and colleagues also have done a very wonderful work uh, uh, on uh, uh, epigalo, you know, EGCG. So, however, when it comes to activity, although it is not toxic, when it comes to its activity, I believe it's slow. So, to to minimize the toxicity of the known drug. And also to enhance the activity of this, you know, for example, you know, more of a nutraceutical or a natural product. So we decided to integrate their structural and functional elements to design such hybrid molecule. And in fact, one of the molecule was found to be uh, less toxic to, you know, cell, you know, the cell, normal cells. And we went ahead and show that. Uh, indeed, that particular compound can be multi, you know, multifunctional uh, molecule and. Uh, not only that, at least, you know, that proved that, you know, such a, you know, concept of hybrid multifunctional inhibitor may hold uh, promise in designing, you know, a, 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 a drug candidates or a, a, a inhibitors for multifaceted amyloid toxicity, uh, because this not only modulate the amyloid toxicity, but also prevent mitochondrial uh, damage. I'm sorry that, you know, I have not shown the data here. It's already published because I know I have to cover many other uh, aspects, but I will be happy to talk about this. So uh, next uh, we uh, see this Alzheimer is such a complex disease. We are not sure, you know, what is, you know, whether, you know, just a small molecule or a peptide or a natural product. We don't know which one was the promise. So here we are interested in, you know, many of these uh, molecular, uh, you know, scaffolds. And uh, in, similarly, so we, uh, you know, very similar to hybrid, uh, you know, HMM or a hybrid multifunctional uh, inhibitor concept, we decided to, you know, kind of a, uh, uh, to, to, to search for a natural product and possible 
you can modify its structure so that you know it become a you know very good you know multifunctional uh, inhibitor in case of uh, amyloid uh, alzheimer disease so we zeroed in on uh, a natural product that is called berberin which uh, looks very similar to curcumin you all aware curcumin is uh, you know kind of a uh, very ubiquitous you know it can you know it has been shown to uh, you know be used against very many diseases and so is berberin however the berberin uh, is at a reason of relatively higher concentration it toxic to uh, cells uh, mainly it uh, you know you know it toxicity meaning uh, it uh, you know it accumulates in the mitochondria and leading leading to mitochondrial disintegration and uh, many other problems so we wanted to overcome this problem so we modified the structure so this is the you know the modified berberin structure so here you know you'll have a uh, ome ome and then there is a methylene bridge so we kind of remove this those uh, methylene bridges and methyl uh, ether uh, uh, functionalities and now this is the berberin derived product which is a, a, a which is soluble unlike the natural product it's also polyphenolic and multifunctional and you can clearly see that you know in fact you know the, the many a times this a beta uh, leads to you know mem, you know reduction in the mitochondrial membrane potential because uh, a beta uh, species interacts with the membrane so here our probe uh, binds to uh, the a beta and prevents its aggregation and in a way it protects the cell and that can be that was actually quantified particularly uh, the neurodegeneration or neuronal death so was you know uh, from a beta was uh, rescued by this particular compound that was understood by you know kind of uh, you know looking at the caspase and uh, uh, you know cytochrome c which are uh, uh, apoptosis uh, marker and as you would uh, see here so in case of a beta you know uh, treated uh, you know a beta so there is a high level of caspases however when we treat the cells with a beta but in presence of ber d this ber berberin d and you would see that you know it reverses the levels of uh, both caspases and caspase and 3 and cytochrome c to a normal level in a way so this molecule protects mitochondria and also cells uh, from apoptosis so uh, the, so far i talked about amyloid beta toxicity and in recent times we also looking into tau uh, because it took some time for us to you know kind of develop uh, expression of tau uh, you know for uh, in 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 in, uh, in you know you know test tube experiments and uh, we could do that you know uh, you know very recently and we developed this you know library of this thiophene based compound and uh, we identified uh, these uh, you know uh, uh, five compounds as a lead uh, from the, in the the from the library small library which i shown uh, in the previous slide and then finally particularly this compound weight was found to be you know effective inhibitor both against a beta and uh, tau this is our uh, very preliminary work uh, you know particularly uh, with respect to tau uh, we just started uh, on the tau uh, otherwise most of the work we have done more you know so far is mostly uh, a beta centered, uh, you know, around centered around A beta related multifaceted uh, toxicity. And uh, finally, before the next couple of minutes, before I conclude, I'll show you one example where uh, we designed a, a drug candidate uh, for Alzheimer or anti-Alzheimer candidate purely by uh, design. So we have designed uh, a you know set of naphthalene uh, monoamide uh, compounds. And we identified one compound that is TGR63 was found to bind A beta and prevents its aggregation, but it also can bind to A beta uh, aggregates, I mean, preformed aggregates, and can dissolve them. That can be you know, seen here. Both you know, it prevents uh, you know, uh, oligomer formation as well as uh, inhibits oligomer formation as well as fibril uh, uh, aggregates. And this also protects, it also protects cells uh, from uh, a beta toxicity again i will not go into the details you know it's uh, you know all of it has been you know kind of documented uh, in this paper so this uh, actually the in vitro and in cellular data encourage us to test uh, this particular compound evaluate the efficacy of this compound in in vivo model by then you uh, know by now you know it is actually a kind of a 10 10 almost 10 years of work and uh, several, you know, five, six years ago, we established a double strand Zanik mice model. And uh, around the time, you know, we have, you know, kind of uh, ready 
for testing this particular compound. And what you see here is the wild type uh, mice brain. And we, all the mice were treated uh, with our uh, drug candidate. The first panel, uh, what you see is a wild type, uh, you know, which is uh, as no AD phenotypic, phenotypic symptoms. The, the central panel is a uh, AD phenotypic mice. You can see loads of amyloid beta. What you see, the red stain, the all of it, uh, A beta uh, aggregates uh, in the AD mice brain. And when we treated these mice uh, with our drug candidate, and you could see that there is a significant reduction in amyloid uh, load or amyloid uh, burden that can be very clearly seen from you know, these uh, zoomed in uh, images uh, from the cortex. So this is the cortex, this is the image, uh, so the hippocampus. Uh, this is the A beta load uh, in, the, in, the, in the AD uh, phenotypic mice. And these mice, when upon, on treating with our drug candidate, you can see that there is a significant reduction. So reduction of around uh, 75 to 80 percent of a beta reduction. This was, you know, very very encourage, encouraging for us. Well, a beta uh, the the reduction in amyloid burden is excellent. However, but that must leads to improvement in cognitive functions. You know, in terms of learning, memory, anxiety. Uh, locomotive functions and so on and so forth. If that doesn't happen, then the reduction in amyloid burden uh, has no meaning. So to study that, we did at least three different uh, behavioral uh, studies, very, very extensive uh, behavioral studies. You can see here, there is an open field test wherein we can understand the locomotive uh, function as well as anxiety and novel object identification test and also Morris uh, water maze test. And these two will tell us uh, about the, their level of learning and uh, memory, if there is a deficiency or if there is an improvement. So I will not go into the data. So I will just take uh, 30 or 40 seconds to show you a video and then I will close uh, my talk here. Uh, can you see the video window? Excellent, thank you. Uh, so what we did in the, so I'm going to show one, uh, 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 one test, one behavioral test that is uh, called Morris water maze test. So here we have a, a water pool and you know, the, this water pool can be divided into this four quadrant. And then in one of the quadrant, we will place a, 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 a platform. So hidden platform. So the platform is, uh, will be kept here. It's slightly, you know, kind of hidden. And then we leave the mice. So we have a you know two set of mice, wild type uh, mice, and which is one is treated, another one is untreated. You know, and the vehicle means untreated. And then we have similarly AD phenotypic uh, mice, which is you know in, in one case we have you know treated uh, with uh, treated with the drug. In another case, you know it's not treated with the drug. So we have two sets are uh, four mice, and we now what we do is we will leave them uh, into the pool and see you know, how good uh, they are in terms of finding this platform that is you know, testing their learning. And later on, we will remove this platform and see whether they remember, they remember the platform that is uh, basically we'll be testing uh, their memory. So let me start the video. See what you see here is a wild type, treated and you know, untreated. And you are AD phenotypic mice treated and treated, and see the wild type healthy one already found the platform, and so is the wild type treated with the drug. Yeah, the AD you know mice treated with the drug also found the platform, but this guy AD mice phenotypic mice without treatment has no clue. So there is a learning deficiency that was uh, yeah so these are various quantification data and now the platform has been removed please uh, give attention how many times these mice will come to the area where the platform was kept now the platform has been removed and you can see that the wild type mice and the ad phenotypic mice treated with the drug comes to that area several times or at that quadrant meaning they remember the location so However, the one which is untreated has no clue. So this is again further uh, quantification. 
I uh, yeah. So I hope. So it's very interesting that you know the 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 reduction in amyloid burden also led to uh, improvement in cognitive functions uh, in terms of uh, learning, memory, locomotive, which I didn't show, and also anxiety that we did in the other phenotypic mice, which is published also available. And uh, so here I would like to uh, mention that this particular candidate now. Uh, uh, we have completed also toxicity studies, all the free clinical studies, and it's been now licensed uh, to a pharma company, in fact, from US uh, for further uh, advanced uh, toxicity studies and also uh, clinical studies. Hopefully, in the you know we, you know the the pharma company has given us you know kind of a uh, one one to two year uh, you know kind of a timeline that to enter you know uh, if everything goes fine for a clinical uh, trials. So. Yeah, with that, I would like to summarize. Uh, of course, I know I've you know, talked about the multifactorial nature of the disease, which involve multiple biomarkers and targets. Uh, differential detection and validation of you know, novel biomarkers, also, you know, I have mentioned. We believe this, the, the multi-pronged approaches uh, you know, that we are following uh, will possibly you know, deliver diagnostic and therapeutic. And I also showed you one, uh, you know, a drug candidate, which is you know came out purely by uh, design, a synthetic uh, molecule. We are very very optimistic, and it's you know will be going forward for for the studies. And of course, once you know since we have worked with both diagnostic and therapeutic aspects, uh, we definitely can look into uh, you know diagnostic therapy. And we moving ahead, of course, you know we need to uh, find out possibly new uh, uh, you know kind of circulating biomarkers. Uh, you know, multiplexing and possibly new biomarkers. You know, with our own uh, work, we are working on, you know, identifying several RNA targets, both for diagnostic and therapeutics. And we also working on uh, cuprosis, uh, peroptosis, and, uh, you know, including uh, mitochondrial dysfunction and many other aspects uh, at a, you know, molecular level, not just for a, you know, kind of a drug design, but at a, you know, to understand the molecular uh, mechanisms. With that, I would like to thank uh, many of my students. The ones which are highlighted are the contributors, particularly Rash Shekhar and Saurabh Samantha uh, contributed very much to this work. Uh, and also Madhu Devashish uh, also contributed and Mauli. And thanks to all the funding agencies and of course for the entire group, although they work on different aspects. So thanks to the group, you know, uh, they are very, very backbone uh, to what we do uh, in our lab. And thank you all, that is our lab uh, in Bangalore. Uh, that is a chemistry lab, and we have biology and uh, animal house uh, somewhere, you know, in the uh, other side of the campus. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. I will be happy to discuss uh, any you know, any questions or queries uh, you have that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really uh, an inspiring talk about uh, your approaches of designing inhibitors. Uh, and um, uh, please, uh, just to remind the audience, uh, you can raise your hand if you want to ask your question directly, or you can just uh, type it in in a Q and A uh, place. Um, any um, anybody from the audience who has, uh, like, from the panelists who has questions? Or I can start with mine. Have you thought of? Um, making um, uh, a, like a drug, you, you made a, uh, a kind of a multifunctional uh, drug which would uh, scavenge metals and buy uh, fibers and so forth. But have you thought of uh, making a, a drug which is, would be both specific for tau and A better, for example? Um, so it takes care of the ball. There's still this argument which comes first and so forth, but they're interconnected. So this, uh, I hope, um, like everybody agrees on that. Um, so, <laughs> have you thought of doing that? Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful question, and also you have put it in a very nice, you know, uh, right perspective. Uh, see, so both are related. Yeah, beta and tau are related, and uh, although we talked about, I talked about multifunctional uh, inhibitors. Uh, but the drug candidate, which I mentioned, uh, it came out very early uh, in our work. So it is still, uh, we believe this is a multifunctional because now we are working on a few other aspects. 
but uh, per se whatever i present it is not still we have not you know shown the multi uh, faceted uh, 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 effect of this compound but we do have now unpublished data that it has many other uh, targets which uh, particularly enhance the memory and when it comes to tau i think i passingly mentioned uh, see so you know it took almost like 14 years for us to you know uh, you know kind of this uh, develop the facility one after the other so we are a chemist started with a cell culture and then animal model and then you know we have you know you know working with a beta and then working on the multi you know factorial nature of uh, a beta and only now uh, we started you know kind of uh, expressing tau and uh, so now uh, last one i know but one i think i one example i showed where the compounds uh, we designed and which works on both a beta and tau and now we need to take it forward and we are also looking into uh, uh, triple transgenic uh, mice model uh, for a you know further studies hopefully uh, we will be successful uh, in doing that uh, in the uh, near future uh, in the, yeah and uh, the, the 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 drug candidate which i showed uh, i also would like to mention there are many more to this drug candidate than just what i presented so we believe this also works uh, uh, on tau and also you know few other uh, uh, functions that we are exploring now hopefully you know i can present or discuss uh, you know probably on some other uh, occasion yeah excuse me so govin i i i like this the questions uh, and that are asked by Mag magda so i, yeah. I have a um, similar like related question like you know the tht i think you also used as a forensic dog and those mm -hmm. actually it kind of worked on all the amyloids right and so it doesn't matter it's a bit or uh, other thing so it, the mechanism is this uh, it has this aromatic structure and binds on this uh, fiber surface so do you know your uh, for your some of the uh, these molecules so what is this mechanism uh, i didn't uh, get it uh -huh. yeah so thank you very much for that uh, question uh, uh, very very important question See the thioflavin T uh, is you know is a non-selective probe. Uh, so you take any protein, we can force this protein to undergo aggregation, and thioflavin T binds to it. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we have designed a very very selective, so uh, you know mark you know uh, probe which binds to A beta. And uh, unfortunately, I uh, wish I had this data because uh, you know of the timeline, I didn't uh, take the data here. Uh, possibly like maybe uh, and also i'm not sure how we are running do we have some time i can show one slide can i uh okay i have to find a <laughs> okay so just a minute not sure <sighs> I should be able to follow. Yeah, so uh, can you see the data here? Yeah. Yeah, see, I, actually, I know I don't have the slide, it may take time. So uh, we did a, another uh, post staining uh, with the A beta, uh, the, the AD patient brain samples. Uh, and then we could see uh, with the thioflavin T and also uh, with the, our, our probe. And thioflavin T, you can see the full background. And that data is actually is there in the paper, you can see that. But in our probe, which you can see that there is a dot kind of uh, staining. So when it stains, it's not staining, you know, staining the entire, you know, uh, fibrils. Rather, it's staining uh, specific, you know, uh, conformations. 
So that is the experimental data. And in fact, I will be very happy if some structural chemists can help us, you know, I can send you that data. So why this is so selective? Experimentally, it is very, very selective. So you can see it binds to only selective confirmation, uh, but that, uh, you know, I'm not a structural chemist, so wish I can collaborate uh, to really truly identify that specific confirmation uh, it binds. And okay. here is additional data I have because this is a biochemical data I just put in here. See, this is a, uh, you know, you can see that this is a, 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 a brain, uh, ADC, uh, sorry, this is a patient samples, uh, brain samples from a supranuclear palsy. That is one of the tauopathy, where you will see only tau aggregates. Uh, and uh, there is no A beta. And when we stain with our probe, you hardly see any staining here. So it also proves that it's very, you know, it's very, very uh, selective uh, over in a tau. And we also did some of the in cellulo uh, uh, experiments and also in vitro experiment. So it doesn't bind to alpha synuclein. It doesn't bind to, you know, BSA. It doesn't bind to any other thing. It doesn't bind to amylin, uh, which is implicated in type two diabetes. Mm. So all of that we have studied and wish I, I could show you the data. I'm afraid, I don't know, if I'm, I'm unable to pull out something that you can see, you know, you would have appreciated when I show that, you know, probably I will, you know, email you. So it binds to specific confirmation that we have visualized but if you ask me at a molecular level we don't have the structure so okay. we'll be happy if some you know somebody like you can help us in that okay. uh, yeah I, i'm interesting yeah we can talk about it later <laughs> yes yes um, yes yeah um we have a, a question from christian i tried to promote him to the panelists but it's um uh, something is going on it, didn't work. Uh, the question is, I read in your paper on TGR63 that you applied yeah. the molecule IP. Is there an oral formulation on the horizon? Yeah, so thank you, uh, Christian, for this uh, question. Uh, I think partially I answered. Uh, so we don't have the oral, oral formulation because our studies are all uh, preclinical uh, in the MICE model, uh, including toxicity data, which I didn't uh, present. But uh, luckily, this the company, uh, the pharma from US has come forward. In fact, we just a month ago, it took almost a year for the negotiations and discussions. So we have completed the agreement and then it has been transferred and they are very, very keen on taking it forward. Uh, that's what uh, hopefully uh, soon uh, they will come up with this uh, formulation uh, for, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, with all <laughs> uh, due, uh, you know, this one. So we are very, very hopeful about this molecule and uh, definitely the formulation is going to play a very, very important role. Uh, in fact, we indeed, we discussed about, you know, on this line uh, ourselves uh, on this, yes. Uh, I, I can say, all, you know, that's all I can say for now, uh, just crossing the finger that, you know, hopefully, uh, we'll have some positive Maybe a follow up question did, did you try to <clears throat> did you try to apply it uh, orally be, be, because i mean um, from the oh, for the mice yeah so, yeah for the, uh, for the mice yes uh, so it's an intraperitoneal uh, injection no no but, but I, I i meant did you try to apply it uh, orally also uh, because uh, no 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 we have not tried that uh, but that is now uh, very important, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it's in the scheme of things, uh, what we are looking forward to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Yeah. In fact, we have discussed as uh, recently as yesterday <laughs> between the company and, you know, our discussion. So you brought up a very important question. Um, we have uh, Ashutosh uh, wants to answer, ask questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I think a very fascinating talk, but I had a related Thank question you. coming and talking about aducanumab, aducanumab uh, drug, which yeah. is yes. body based and clears the plaques and tangles. And the scientific community has mixed feelings about that because the clearing of plaques doesn't restore the uh, Alzheimer's loss of memory or the function, especially in the advanced stage, uh, patients who are taking. So there was no benefit seen that way. So related to that, your drug, is it 
being given to mice models in the early stage or you are trying late stage and you do have mixed response or you're seeing the restoration back? Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much question. And again, this also, I kind of uh, didn't elaborate. I didn't wanted to elaborate that aspect. I, although I mentioned the conditional approval, and also I mentioned during our own candidate because this reduction in amyloid uh, blocks uh, is not the proof uh, you know, uh, to be considered as a drug candidate. That's why we have done this uh, elaborative, uh, you know, three different uh, uh, behavioral tests and which clearly showed uh, improvement in the memory. I showed only one uh, at least in our data, but we have other two, two more. Uh, this is, you know, kind of a standard and very well, uh, you know, uh, articulated and you know uh, performed uh, uh, in addition to this uh, so again i uh, you know indirectly i alluded uh, we also you know this is something which we, we have not proved it but uh, our own uh, uh, what to say so we observe that there is a improvement in memory uh, you know some level of improvement in the memory even in the white type when we give this drug Okay, there was no toxicity, but rather we found there is some improvement in the memory. And uh, later on, we are looking into many uh, other aspects that this molecule not only just you know dissolving aggregates, but also playing a role. Uh, you know, possibly there are some other targets as well uh, wherein it is improving the memory that we are uh, looking into. So that is our observation, and it is very very clear to us. But now we are trying to prove that it is also acting on some of the memory, you know, proteins, targets, the enzymes, so which are linked to memory. I, I had another question and relates to the beginning of the slide. You showed a very fascinating statement. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, sorry, another question I think I missed I out. So when did you give? No, no, ah, no okay. I'm just asking. I'm saying this, this relates to another part of the talk. Yeah, okay, and okay. The aging part that you had a statement, a true disease, not an inevitable part of aging. I understand the normal part of aging is very different than the Alzheimer's. So mm -hmm. how do you explain the late onset Alzheimer's where it's a sporadic cause? Where still the aging is considered the biggest risk factor. I understand it's not the normal part of aging, but. Okay, uh, so thank you again for that question. Hope I have not uh, made it. <laughs> so the, I, I used to tell this in India. Uh, okay, so what happened, you know, uh, in India, I didn't want to go into the this. I, I skipped actually a couple of slides and then there. see what happened in India. We uh, believe this uh, either you know mental illness or a neuro any related you know neurodegenerative diseases. We used to just okay, it's like a, a related to aging, and then that's it. We didn't we wouldn't do anything behind that. So that's why I used to make that uh, you know statement. And at the same time, I don't think no harm in making the statement. Alzheimer is pretty much, uh, you know, aging will play a role because I also talked about reactive oxygen species and also pretty much that is part of the aging. But in addition to aging, there is a clear uh, difference in terms of, you know, molecular level, uh, you, know, uh, you know, basis, molecular basis for the disease. Uh, for example, if you take a memory deficit, uh, you know, uh, in case of aging, uh, you know, it, it will never fall to zero in case of a normal aging. But if you take an Alzheimer disease, when we detect, usually, for example, it will happen in a normal case, it happens around 60, 65. Uh, and then from, you know, then when we detect this Alzheimer through behavioral changes, it's also a, uh, already an advanced stage. And from there, the memory take a free, fall, free fall. So, you know, almost free fall. So that, you know, in that sense, in that sense, I can say there is a difference between aging, clearly say aging and uh, Alzheimer disease. But I, at the same time, I, I agree, I cannot you know, disagree with you that there are elements of uh, aging. You know, in fact, you remember one of the, uh, the amino acids, you know, GHK, which you use to develop some multifunctional molecule. I, I, there I mentioned that is also linked, you know, that level comes down. So inevitably aging also, you know, plays a role here. 